All right. How's everybody doing today? Hotep. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022, and we are live. All right. I wanted to come on uh, and talk for a short period of time. I wanted to give an overview of uh, a preview of the online class uh, that I teach on uh, Wednesdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. But also, I wanted to talk about um, this topic, and we just, we deal with this in uh, my 10-week online class. Uh, I wanted to deal with this topic of African empires and African civilizations that Europeans tried to claim as their own. And in some cases, Arabs tried to claim it as their own as well. And this goes beyond Kemet. This goes beyond Egypt. Egypt is one of them. That's probably the most prominent. But there are others as well. And I, I posted a video on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Some of you all saw this video. It got, um, uh, it got about 1,500 likes. And it deals with this uh, white archaeologist who finds out that the uh, uh, ancient Africans, this is dealing, uh, this one here is dealing with uh, Nubia. Um, he finds out that the uh, ancient uh, uh, Egyptian pharaohs and the Nubians were, were black Africans and he's shocked. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. Okay. But uh, we do a thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place in this temple. So we'll give you some information, how you could register for it, how you could join us in class uh, today at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, but you're going to learn a lot in this 10-week uh, online course. So if we look at some of these uh, African empires that Europeans try to claim uh, as their own, uh, the first one that, that we'll look at would be that of Nubia. Okay. The first one would be uh Nubia and uh or Tahesi or Tasteti. Okay. And uh Nubia exists from about 4500 uh BCE before the common era uh to 500 AD. Okay. And somebody E, e Verdi says South Sudan like the Egyptian. Yes. Yeah, so you're looking at the uh lower portion of uh kemet or egypt in the upper portion of the sudan this is the area that was uh nubia okay you're going to have a larger region that's going to be kush that's a that's basically a region as opposed to a country okay so uh let's look at this here and i'll post uh, we have information here in the thread of the broadcast to register for the class also visit our website the african history network.com the african history network.com and uh, you can register for the class right now, okay? And I'll post the uh, I'll post the information here on the thread of the broadcast as well. The class is on sale, sixty dollars. Regularly, one hundred thirty dollars is on sale for a limited time only. Okay, so ancient Nubia or Tas or Taset Taseti, also known as Kush, was a region along the Nile River, located in uh, northern Sudan and southern Egypt located in northern Sudan and southern Egypt or Kemet. It was home to some of the uh, uh, some of Africa's earliest kingdoms known for uh, rich deposits of gold. Uh, Nubia was a major trading port for luxury goods that came from sub-Saharan Africa, such as incense, ivory and ebony. Now, the first uh, monarchy of recorded history was established in Nubia. Uh, the Nubians were also known for their exceptional archery skills, okay, their e exceptional archery skills uh, that provided the uh, uh, military strength for their rulers, okay? So one of the names of Nubia is also a land of the boat, okay, land of the boat. This is what Taseti means land of the bow. 
Um, the you'll also hear referred to as Tanahesi as well. The southern portion is uh Tanahesi, if I remember correctly. Tanahesi. Now, kings of uh Nubia ultimately conquered uh and ruled Egypt for about a uh, hundred years, for about one century. Monuments still stand in modern Kemet or m modern Egypt and Sudan at the sites where. Nubian rulers built cities, temples, and royal pyramids. Now, in the 1800s, uh, the Western world's interest in Nubia was awakened by the discovery of the ancient empire's monuments, which were reported almost simultaneously by individual British, French, and American explorers. Many of them found it difficult to credit indigenous Africans for building such a civilization. Now, this is the same thing that we found with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Europeans found it hard to uh, ascribe the pyramids and the temples to indigenous black African people. All right. And one of the theories, and if you read, um, Nile Valley contributions to civilization by Tony Brown, Around one the book we use in the 10 week online class. I'm around, we're going to do like 11 to 12 weeks because some sessions I had to cut short because of my work schedule. Um, one of the theories was from these European archaeologists and, and scientists, things like this. One of the theories was that the ancient Egyptians were brown skinned Caucasians. This is one of the theories that they had, at, you know, over the years. They said that they were brown-skinned Caucasians. They tried to, uh, they tried to classify them as anything but being black African, but being Negro. Okay. They said no. They, they, they maybe they're Semites. Maybe they're uh, uh, descended from this. These people. Maybe they're uh, brown-skinned Caucasians. Anything but black Africans. Okay. Now, so. Uh, many of many of these scientists and archaeologists found it difficult to credit indigenous Africans for building such a civilization. Then you had some idiots who said, uh, oh, well, it may, maybe aliens built the uh, the pyramids because we can't we, we you know, they can't figure this out. So maybe aliens built the pyramids. Now, there 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 are. Um, twice as many pyramids in the Sudan as there are in Egypt. There are twice as many pyramids in the Sudan as there are in Egypt, okay? The only child said there is a study guide uh, to Nile Valley contributions to civilization. That is true. I do. I have the study guide also, okay? Browder's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him a number of times on... Uh, I've interviewed him a number of times on the African History Network show. And this would be the study guide for Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. I have that as well. Okay. All right. Also, I talked to Browder about he went to, uh, he was speaking at an educational summit in South Africa because I want to uh, do another interview with them. Okay, now let's continue here. Okay, so I, I, I showed this video. I, I, I um, shared this video on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, a couple of days ago. And people have been watching it. They've been going crazy over it. It's gotten over 1,500 likes. And I, and I see other people have been sharing our video and other Facebook platforms uh, have been sharing the video as well. Okay, so remember, we were one of the first ones to share it. But uh, in this video here, you have this European scientist, all right, and uh, he's disappointed when he finds out that ancient Egyptian pharaohs were black Africans. He's disappointed. And when I when I posted this on our Facebook page, I said, who the hell did he expect the ancient Egyptians to be? Brown skinned Caucasians? Because this is this is the information that is that has been put forth, but the same thing applies to Nubia because these are cousins, okay? 
these are cousins the, the same thing applies and then when you then when you see movies like cleopatra starring elizabeth taylor what this does is this colonizes people's minds not just europeans but also african people african americans it colonizes our minds and makes us think that these historical uh figures were europeans and they were not this this is the problem every easter when people sit up and watch the ten commandments starring yul brenner as uh, as uh ramses okay the egyptian pharaoh the comedic pharaoh ramses wasn't no european he was african that's a whole i've, I've done a whole presentation dealing with uh the history of easter we did this uh um we did it earlier this year we did it um april around easter time 2022 to get deep into it and deal with the exodus story as well okay because the exodus story is problematic all right so so you trying to tell me i'm gonna show this video in just a second but hold on you're trying to tell me that two million people it was, it was supposed to be two million uh people that that exited out of out of kemet out of egypt okay you're trying to tell me that two million hebrews or jews or however you want however you want to describe them two million of them wandered in the desert for 40 years you're trying to tell me two million of them wandered in the desert for 40 years where did they get water from for two million people for 40 years in the desert what did they eat in the desert two million people for 40 years now i can hear some people right now complaining and things like this so let, let me let me do let me show you i want to show you this source for you to go research this yourself Pro documentation ends all conversation you don't have to word i say go research this yourself okay now this article here and this was part of part of my research and, and part of the presentation i did earlier in the year when we dealt with easter and the exodus and and, and all that history okay this is from history.com which is the official website of the history channel this is an article called passover okay so article go pass called passover we'll read this entire article all right and it goes through and deals with the biblical story of easter and uh the israelites departure from ancient egypt and all this that's in the bible that's in the helios biblos the sun book helios is in reference to to sun s-u-n the helios biblical so it goes through and talks about the passover story which is really a story about killing african male children okay uh it was supposed to be uh all the african male children under two years old these weren't europeans they were killing these weren't european children they were killing who were they killing african children okay so it goes through and talks about the 10 plagues and and all of that that we read that we learned about in sunday school for me it was catechism class because i grew up catholic so we went to catechism school on saturday as opposed to sunday school on sunday okay then it talks about according to the bible and things like this then it gets to a portion then it gets to this part right here questions of historical accuracy questions of historical accuracy okay now we have to understand this world history is in world history books religious literature is in religious literature books okay world history and religious literature are not the same thing and this is where a lot of our people get confused now i may say some things that are outside of the circumference of your own awareness just because you disagree with them or don't like them uh or haven't heard them before does not mean that they are not true it just means you have to do some research to understand what i'm talking about okay and i learned this one from uh, one of my teachers dr ray hagans and uh i usually have this uh in my presentations especially you know when i do presentations and especially when i do presentations in person and uh i may be dealing with a mixed audience uh may have different races in the audience things like this okay so i usually have people put their fingers together uh to form a circle and i use say usually say something like this the space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge 
everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. So the reason why I say this is, is because oftentimes uh, when people hear something that contradicts what they believe or what they think they know, they automatically reject it without doing any research to determine the validity of the new information that they're that they're learning. And they usually don't use that same level of scrutiny to analyze, critique, or evaluate what it is they believe or what they think they know. So uh, just because you know everything that what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. Okay, so I say that to say this here. So this, this section here of this article from history.com, history.com is the official website of the History Channel. In the article called Passover, it says questions of historical accuracy. Questions of historical accuracy. And it says for centuries, scholars have been debating the details and historical merit of the events commemorated during pa during the Passover holiday, okay? For centuries, uh, scholars have, have debated, have been debating the details and historical merit of the events commemorated during the Passover holiday. Despite numerous attempts, despite numerous attempts, historians and archaeologists have failed to corroborate the tale of the Jews' enslavement in and mass ex and mass exodus from Egypt. Okay, they have failed to corroborate the tale of the Jews' enslavement in Egypt and their mass exodus from Egypt. Okay, now this is not anti-Semitic. This is not being against anybody. This is understanding history. Okay. Go read this article. This is not me saying this. This is what the History Channel is telling you. Now, they go on to say, although the ancient Egyptians kept thorough records, no mention is made of an Israelite community within their midst or any calamities resembling the 10 biblical plagues. There is also no evidence of large encampments in the Sinai Peninsula, the fabled site of the Jews wandering or any sudden fluctuation in Israel's archaeological record that would indicate the departure and return of a large population. Do you realize that 2 million people or 1.5 million or, or a million people wandered around in the desert for 40 years or left a country and then went to another country? You, you understand that would throw off the ecology of that country? And, the, and, and, and it will leave archaeological remnants behind, archaeological evidence. Stuff, you can't, you can't just write something in the history and, and, and don't realize that people in history leave uh, archaeological footprints, okay? It, it, this stuff doesn't happen. A hand, it goes on to say a handful of scholars, including the first century Jewish historian Josephus, which would be spelled with the Y because the letter J wasn't created in 1630 AD, have suggested a link between the Israelites and the Hyksos, a mysterious Semitic people, possibly from Canaan, who controlled lower Egypt for more than 100 years before their expulsion during the 16th century BCE, before the common era. Most modern academics, however, have dismissed this theory due to chronological conflicts and a lack of similarity between the two cultures, okay? So read the, read this full article. Don't just read the part about question of historical accuracy. Read that, definitely. Because this gets left out when people sit up and watch the Ten Commandments every Easter, okay? This gets left out of the conversation. But read that full article from history history.com okay 
Now I want to go back to uh, my point presentation. And these are some slides from the class that I teach also. Okay. The 10 week online class teaching Kim at the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and we have a, we normally teach this class on Wednesday, 7 PM, uh, to 9 PM Eastern standard time. So I'm teaching the class at our online school tonight. So you can register for the, uh, full course. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch the classes anytime a year from now, two years from now, you can watch the entire class. Okay. Uh, so, so here's what happened with, uh, this, uh, this scientist who didn't know that ancient Egyptian pharaohs were Africans. Uh, let's go here. I'm gonna get this to play. Just a second here. Okay, let's see, why isn't this, hold on. I may have to go to the video on my Facebook page for it to play. Um, there is a, okay, let's do it this way. We just pull up on my Facebook page. Uh, hold on. But the CT scan has one more surprise for Alejandro. Shamai's ethnicity. Well, okay, here, let's play it. Uh, let's play it off of Facebook. They have just told me that uh, Shamai had a Nubian. Let me see, let's back this up. Feature which means that um, the ruling family was probably Nubian and that, that was unexpected. Examine Shemaiyan's closest, the thickness of his bone and the shape of his nasal cavity. The anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always saw the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. And in this sense, Shemai is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups were mixed. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. Okay. All right. So, what is this? he said that they thought that the ancient Egyptians were uh, Mediterranean. This is another. This is another way they try to obfuscate the history. Okay, so they try to say the ancient Egyptians were Mediterranean, brown skin, Caucasians, anything but Black Africans. All right, I'm going to play this again. Uh, scientists disappointed when he finds out that the ancient Egyptian pharaohs were black Africans. And they, they mentioned Nubia in here as well. Okay, so let me pull this back up. And I tried this, uh, it, it it played uh, in PowerPoint, it played in PowerPoint um, before I broadcast when I was testing everything out, but it won't, it won't play now. Okay, let's see. Let's go to this here. Okay. 
All right, let's try to play. I hate these videos. And well, they, they have just told. This game has one more surprise for Alandro. Shamai's ethnicity. Well, they have just told me that uh, Shamai had a Nubian feature, which means that um, their ruling family was probably Nubian, and th that was unexpected. Examining Shamai's anatomy closely, the thickness of his bone and the shape of his nasal cavity the anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. And in this sense, Shemai is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups were mixed. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was the Egyptian. All right. Yeah. So he says he has to admit Shemai was Egyptian. He said it doesn't matter the color of your skin, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He said they thought the they thought the Egyptian elite were a uh, Mediterranean type. Just just more nonsense. Okay, so he got a um, <laughs> he got a real wake up call with uh, that scientific discovery. Now, during the 1840s, uh, German Egyptologist Carl Richard Lepsius, uh, who lived from 1810 to 1884 asserted confidently that the greek term ethiopian the greek term ethiopian when referring to the ancient civilized people of kush did not apply to negroes he said it did not apply to negroes but was used to describe reddish skinned people closely related to the egyptians who quote belong to the caucasian race end quote okay so they're trying to ascribe um the uh, uh egyptians and nubians things like this uh they're trying to ascribe them to the caucasian race and and say and describe them as reddish skinned people okay they also said that the egyptians were brown skinned caucasians brown skinned caucasians now we uh, historically like in uh, ancient Kemet, but also we see this in Ethiopia, Somalia. Um, a, a, a lot of them had didn't have uh, broad noses and thick lips. Some of them had more aquiline features, narrow noses, thinner lips, some of them, okay? These were still Black Africans. So we see all these mental gymnastics that take place with people who don't want to admit that uh, one of the greatest civilizations in history was uh, created by black African people. They don't, they don't want to deal with that, all right? And we see the same thing with Nubia, okay? We see the same thing with Carthage, where you have Hannibal Barca and the Carthaginians. Okay, how's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast, share this broadcast. On your social media platforms also be sure to uh register for the 10-week online class that i teach uh on wednesday ancient alpha understanding the translate trade what they didn't teach you in school so we teach this uh on wednesday 7 p.m to 9 p.m about 9 p.m or so um eastern standard time uh, on Wednesdays, okay? So we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Just click right here and register here to register. Classes on sale, $60, regularly $130. So I'm just, and this is one of the topics that we deal with in the class, um, African empires that Europeans try to claim as their own. Now on Tuesdays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we had a great class yesterday. 
We're going to do part two of that coming up in the next few days. This class is on sale six dollars as well. We we start in the eighteen hundred with the uh, eighteen hundred census, and then we look at the Louisiana Purchase of eighteen o three and the Haitian Revolution because those two events are related and we go through our history chronologically and see what leads up to the civil war reconstruction jim crow era uh great migration world war one world war ii civil rights movement black power movement we also have a bundle pack here both classes you can get both classes right now for a very limited time only for 100 100 as uh uh over 300 value because there's bonus content that you get so click here register here for that and if you've taken any of my online classes in the past you can email me through the website, click on contact the African History Network, email me, and you'll get a 50% discount. Or email us at AHN Show at the African History Network.com. AHN Show at the African History Network.com. And I just posted the link here to uh, register for the classes. These courses make a great gift, also. You can uh, get the register somebody else if you want to and you can um, use these for your children i would say the content is pg-13 you can use these for your children as, uh, as well okay let's continue here um so during the 1840s um uh, german egyptologist carl richard lepsius asserted confidently that the greek term ethiopian when referring to the ancient civilized people of kush did not apply to Negroes, but was used to describe reddish skinned people, reddish skinned people closely um, related to the Egyptians who belonged to the Caucasian race. All right, let's continue. Now, Nubia was uh, in recorded history is the first recorded monarch, okay, or monarchy. Now, ancient Egypt is uh, the first major civilization in Africa for which records are abundant. It was not, however, Africa's first kingdom. Uh, and, and we know that um, Nubia is the mother of Kemet. Ta-Nehisi, ta is the mother of ancient Kemet. Um, the, the grandmother of Kemet would be Abyssinia or Ethiopia, okay, because civilization flows up the Nile River. So the grandmother is Abyssinia or Ethiopia. Nubia is the mother, uh, and then you have ancient Kemet. So there was, a, uh, there was an article from the New York Times from March 1st, 1979, March 1st, 1979, and I, and I read the article today. I've seen excerpts of the article uh, previously, but I read the article in its entirety today. Uh, a March 1st, 1979 uh, article uh, from the New York Times, it was a front page article written by journalist Boyce uh, Rensberger, R-E-N-S-B-E-R-G-E-R, -E -E Rensberger, reported, quote, evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia or Ta Seti. The artifacts, including hundreds of fragments of pottery, jewelry, stone vessels, and ceremonial objects, such as incense burners, were initially recovered from the uh, Coastal uh, Q-U-S-T-U-L cemetery by Keith C. Seal, S-E-E-L-E, -E, a professor at the University of Chicago. Now, uh, if, when we look at the definition of a monarchy, so we'll consult uh, Encyclopedia Britannica for this, Britannica.com. A monarchy is a political system based upon the undivided sovereignty or rule of a single person, the undivided sovereignty or rule of a single person. The term applies to states in which supreme authority is vested in the monarch, an individual ruler who functions as the head of state and who achieves his or her position through heredity. They inherit it. They, they inher uh, it, 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 it's 
it's uh, they inherit it. OK, uh, most monarchies allow only male succession, usually from father to son. OK, but in uh, Nubia, we saw a number of uh, African queens uh, in Nubia also. All right. OK, let's continue. Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. It helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. We have the information on the homepage of our, of our website as well. Uh, if we look some more at this article that was cited um, from March 1st, 1979. It's a pretty interesting article. There have been advances made. There have been more archaeological discoveries that have come out since then. But it's interesting what they were saying in 1979. I was eight years old in 1979, uh, by the way, as well. Ancient Nubian artifacts yield evidence of earliest monarchy. This is from the New York Times, March 1st, 1979. Evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history preceding the rise of the uh, earliest Egyptian kings by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia in Africa. Until now, it had been assumed that at that, that at that time, the ancient Nubian culture, which existed in what is now Southern Sudan and Southern Egypt has not advanced beyond had not advanced beyond a collection of scattered tribal clans and chiefdoms. The existence of rule by kings indicates a more advanced form of political organization in which many chiefdoms are united under a more powerful and wealthier ruler. The discovery is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of civilization in Africa, raising the question of to what extent later Egyptian culture may have derived its advanced political structure from the Nubians. The various symbols of Nubian royalty that have been found uh, have been found are the same as those associated in later times with Egyptian kings or Egyptian pharaohs or the Nasubites. The discovery is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of African civilization and raising questions of two. Okay, that's a, uh, that's a duplicative. Um, the new findings suggest that ancient Nubians may have reached this stage of political development as long as as long ago as 3300 BCE before the common era or BC several generations several generations before the earliest documented Egyptian king or pharaoh or Nasubiti now the discovery the discovery is based on a study uh, based on study of artifacts from ancient tombs excavated 15 years ago, okay? So that'll go back to like 1964 or so, because uh, this article's from 1979, 15 years ago, and, and enter, uh, 64, 65, in an international effort to rescue archaeological deposits between, uh, before, the rising waters of the Aswan Dam covered them. Okay, so check out this article here from um, the, the New York Times, March 1st, 1979. Ancient Nubian artifacts yield evidence of earliest monarchy. Okay, now another um, African empire that Europeans tried to claim as their own, all right, is that of Carthage. And we'll talk about Carthage uh, in today's class. And when you register for the class, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. 
and uh, we'll post a link here again uh, so you can register uh, for the course. And we also have the bundle bundle court, the bundle pack as well. We get both classes for one hundred dollars. This uh, over three hundred dollar value because uh, today we'll talk about uh, the Punic Wars and Hannibal Barca and the Battle of Kanai. OK, so there was a. Um, on the History Channel, they had a series called barbarians rising barbarians rising this is back in 2015 and nicholas pinnock portrayed uh hannibal barker okay um and he did an excellent job portraying hannibal barker history channel's newest documentary series barbarians rising tackles the fall of Rome over the course of 700 years of invasions. Um, however, the most recent episode that aired Monday depicts Hannibal of Carthage as a black man, which he was, and many white history buffs are crying foul over the what they say is historical inaccuracy. In the series, Hannibal is portrayed by black British actor Nicholas Pennock. He did a fantastic job of it. I've posted his picture on our um, fan page, the African History Network, before also. Okay, so the famous Carthaginian Hannibal Barker was a thorn in the uh, Roman Empire side. He became a general at the age of 26 and managed to unite barbarian tribes to uh, stop Rome's imperial rise. The military genius was uh, famous for climbing the Alps with uh, war elephants whose sole, pur whose sole purpose was to stomp the Roman Empire. Hannibal Barca ultimately wanted to invade Rome, but he failed to do so. Now, there have been debates over the race of Hannibal. This debate still continues to this day. It's not much of a debate, okay? The uh, Carthaginians are descendants of the Phoenicians. Phoenicians are descendants of a larger group called the Garamantes. These are all African. These are black African people. These, these are not Arabs. These are black African people. Uh, check out this article from AtlantaBlackStar.com from June 7th, 2016. It was 2016 that the uh, series came out, uh, Barbarians, Ri Barbarians Rising. History Channel portrays Hannibal as black. White people cry foul over historical revisionism. OK, and um, Carthage, uh, which exists from 813 BCE to 146 BCE, because Rome destroys Carthage. OK, uh, this is another African empire that Europeans try to claim as their own as well. OK. Um, so. Carthage was founded in the 9th century BCE on the Gulf of Tunis from the 6th century BCE before the Common Era or BC. Uh, from the 6th century BCE onwards, it developed into a great trading empire. It developed into a great trading empire uh, covering much of the Mediterranean and was home, and was home to a brilliant civilization. In the course of the long Punic Wars, which exists from 264 BCE to 146 BCE, and we'll talk about the Punic Wars in, um, in class today. In, in the course of the long Punic Wars, Carthage occupied some of Rome's territories before finally being destroyed by its rival Rome in uh, 146 BCE. Now, in his book, World's Great Men of Color, Volume 1, Joel Augustus Rogers, uh, better known as J.A. Rogers, asserts that the Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people, and that, in fact, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, Hannibal Barker was traditionally known as a black man. 
So when we see a a rise in the European phenotype and um, Europeans are coming out of the Dark Ages, going from the going from the 1300s into the 1400s AD Common Era, as they start to conquer people's lands and enslave people, extract the mineral wealth out of their land, Europe is starting to rebuild itself. Europe had lost one quarter to one third of their population to the Black Death, the bubonic plague that hits and spurts from 1347 to 1400. So as they, as you have a rise in European powers, Spain and Portugal and uh, France and Germany, England, things like this, as you have a rise in European powers, you have a rise in the dominance of European phenotypes. So Europeans start to reinterpret images that were traditionally African. They start to reinterpret those as European. They reinterpret the Black Madonna and Child as, as being European, okay? Uh, and the Black Madonna and Child was worshiped all throughout Europe. And we know that comes from uh, Asar, Aset, and Heru, okay, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. We see Michelangelo paint the, paint the Sistine Chapel, and he uses his aunt and uncle as the uh, image of Adam and Eve, and he paints uh, God as being white. We see um, Hercules was traditionally black traditionally African, he gets reinterpreted as being a European. We see Zeus. Zeus, in Greek mythology, Zeus is said to be the king of the gods. But they say Zeus comes from Ethiopia. Okay, he gets reinterpreted as a European. So we're going to see th th this take place when, when Europe comes uh, out of the Dark Ages. All right, now. Um, today, many encyclopedias classify the Carthaginians as whites or Semites, as whites or Semites, but ancient Greek and Roman eyewitness accounts paint a different picture. The indigenous peoples of Carthage were called the Afers, A-F-E-R-S, the Afers. Ancient Roman poet Virgil, in his poem Mortum, M-O-R-E-T-U-M, speaks of a woman from the Afir or Afar, A-F-A-R, or Afra, A-F-R-A, race. And he says of her, quote, and all her figure proves her native land. And all her figure proves her native land. Her hair was curly, thick, her lips, and dark, her hair color. Her hair was curly, thick, her lips, and dark her hair color, unquote. Now, in uh, Library of History book 20, Roman numeral 20, XX, Roman numeral 20, Greek historian Diodorus mentions a Greek lieutenant named Agathocles, Agatho, Agathocles, who defeated a people in the area of present-day Tunisia who were the same hue as Ethiopia. The eyewitness accounts are corroborated by physical anthropology. L. Berthelon and E. Chantre, both well-noted French anthropologists, documented their examination of skeletons throughout, the, throughout North Africa in all periods. They note that the remains of both upper and lower class individuals of ancient North Africa were representative of the Negro race. They note that the remains of both upper and lower class individuals of ancient North Africa were representative of the Negro race. So these were black African people. All right. Um, so that, that deals with Carthage and the Carthaginians and the Carthaginians are involved in the Punic Wars from about 264 to uh, about 146 uh, BC. Uh, then we have the uh, 
kingdom of Great Zimbabwe. This is another uh, African empire that Europeans tried to claim as their own. Now, the kingdom of Great Zimbabwe existed from about 1220 common era CE or AD to 1450 common era. Okay. And how's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. How you like this type of reformation? Okay. Who still needs to register for our 10 week online class uh, that I teach on Wednesdays? Uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And what we're going to do is also we're going to have a new um, session of this class start up on uh, Monday, November 29th, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, Monday, November 28th, we're going to have a new uh, session of this class start up uh, Monday, November 28th. And so we're going to enroll you this class now. That's coming to an end of two or three weeks, and we'll enroll you in the new class for for one price, for one cost, one admission, one uh, registration cost. So you don't have to worry about paying for both classes. Okay, um, we'll post the link again here. You can register for the classes uh, right now, and you can join us in class uh, today because we normally teach these uh, seven p.m. to nine p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday. So we'll post the link here and it's in the thread of the broadcast as well. In the description here of um, the broadcast. Okay, let's continue. We'll be here for a few more minutes. Uh, the civilization of Great Zimbabwe was one of the most significant civilizations during the medieval period. Great Zimbabwe is extraordinary because of the magnificent scale of its structures, its most uh, most striking edifice uh, referred to as the Great Enclosure. The Great Enclosure has walls as high as 36 feet, extending approximately 820 feet. Walls as high as 26 feet, uh, 36 feet, walls as high as 36 feet, extending approximately 820 feet, okay? Um, the uh, making it the largest ancient structure south of the Sahara Desert. Now, in the 1800s, European explorers, imperialists, and colonizers were stunned by Great Zimbabwe's grandeur and cunning workmanship. So they attributed the architecture to Portuguese travelers, Arabs, Chinese, Persians or even biblical characters or even biblical characters such as King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. OK, once again. Don't want to give Africans credit for what we do. OK, and this is uh, what European colonizers and imperial imperialists uh, did. Now, according to the Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art, archaeological investigations conducted during the first decades of the 20th century have dismissed those attributions um, and confirmed both the antiquity of the site and its African origins, both the antiquity of the site and its African origins. Uh, the antiquity of the site and its African origins, uh, it was built by the ancestors of the indigenous Shona people, okay, who are in um, uh, Zimbabwe today, the Shona, okay. It was built by the ancestors of the indigenous Shona people in the 11th century long before the first Europeans ever set foot in Zimbabwe. Okay, now, the last uh, African empire that we'll look at is Namibia. Namibia, not Namibia, okay, but Namibia, okay, which existed from 202 BC, uh, BCE to 46 BCE, before the Common Era. 
Now, Namibia was another great black Berber Libyan nation in northern Algeria, Namibia. During the time of the Romans and the Carthaginians. Now, this is during the time of the Punic Wars. And we're going to see Namibia side with the Romans against the Carthaginians. Now, it began as a sovereign state and later alternated status between Roman province and Roman client state. It is considered to be the first major state in the history of Algeria and the Berber world. Now, Namibia has also been classified by European and Arab historians as a Caucasian or Semitic built civilization. European and Arab historians tried to claim uh, Namibia as their own, saying it was a Caucasian or Semitic built civilization. However, in uh, his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Dr. Chancellor Williams, Dr. Chancellor Williams declared that Libya was once so nearly all black that to be called a Libyan meant that one was black. Okay. At one point, Libya was so black that to be called a Libyan meant that one was black. The Greek, the Greek historian Herodotus, writing about Libya in his uh, book, Histories, book four, stated, quote, one thing I can add about this country so far as one knows, it is inhabited by four races and four only of which two of these races are indigenous, uh, two are indigenous and two are not indigenous. The indigenous peoples are the Libyans and Ethiopians. The former occupy, referring to the Libyans, occupying the northerly and the latter, the more southerly parts. The immigrants are the Phoenicians and the Greeks. The immigrants are the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Now, one of the most famous, end quote, now one of the most famous Berber Moors of the Roman times was uh, Ma uh, Masinissa, Masinissa, M-A-S-I-N-I-S-S-A, -S -S Masinissa, who was the king of Numidia. He lives from 238 BCE to 148 BCE. Now, Masinissa, assisted the Romans against the Carthaginians during the Punic Wars, okay? And when you study the Punic Wars, you, you, you read about this. We deal with this in the class. Uh, now, this coin here depicts uh, the coin depictions and statues of King Masinissa confirm with, without doubt that this great Berber leader and king of the Moors was phenotypically a black African man with woolly hair, with woolly hair, similar to the West African type. Now, Syphax, S-Y-P-H-A-X, king of the uh, Massalinians, the, Mas uh, the, the Mas uh, Massalinians, M-A-S-A-E-S-Y-L-I-A-N-S, -A -S -S, uh, the Massalinians in the Midia, a contemporary and great rival of King Massinissa, was also depicted in his coinage as a phenotypically black African. Now, this is a coin of Juba the first, king of Namibia. Um, he lived from 85 BCE to 46 BCE. He was the king of Namibia. Um, it, it, this is the front and back of uh, his coin. Okay, a, a coin depicting him, I should say. All right. So this is just a sample of some of the type of information we deal with in the 10 week online class that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach them in school. We go through and uh, look at thousands of years, thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Um, and we look at, try to look at this history as much chronologically as we can. We can't start studying our history uh, in slavery. 
uh there's some books that we reference also you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class some of the uh and these are different slides that we use in the course also some of the things that we deal with uh in the class i'll show you this here so we can't start studying our history and slavery even when we study the transatlantic slave trade which is important to study we can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese uh, get involved. Uh, we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of, of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who enter into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal in uh, 711 AD, okay? Um, it, it, into North Africa in 711 AD. This course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but we do with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade of African people taking place. Now, August 20th, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans on the White Lion pirate ship coming into uh, Virginia, okay? And uh, in Point Comfort, coming into Point Comfort on August 20th, 1619 in Virginia. Now, that year, 2019, was known as the year of return as many African-Americans uh, were reconnecting and still are reconnecting to Africa and traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the land we call the United States of America or what Native Americans call Turtle Island. We've been here in this land at least 51,700 years. Now, this does not mean that the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. It means that we were here for tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade happened. It did happen, but you have to understand the history before that. So some of the things we deal with in class, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus is crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade and the spread of it. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We deal with that complicated history. Um, we deal with Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, links to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity, Freemasonry, and the making of America. Um, I, we look at uh, work from uh, Dr. David M. Hotep, who's a friend of mine, who wrote the book, The First Americans, where Africans documented evidence. And on page 14 of his book, he deals with a discovery in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004, where uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear and, and his team discovered 13 different types of evidence that uh, fairly documented an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago, at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, skull, skeleton structures and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. And these were the Khoisan, the short statured Africans coming from Southern Africa that they were talking about. Now, this is an article from ScienceDaily.com, which is a scientific website. They have scientific discoveries there, archaeological discoveries. They um, have this article from November 18, 2004, that deals with Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago, okay? So they give a summary of his discovery, all right? And what they say is, is radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed um, last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by uh, University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts or at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. So you can go read that entire article that came out November 18th, 2004. 
And these different archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week. Uh, they're causing the scientists and archaeologists and paleontologists to push the timelines back. OK, they keep having to push the timelines back. Uh, it's causing them to rethink everything. Now, uh, in October 2012, genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly known, uh, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, okay, the Khoisan are genetically uh, unique and no other currently known population had separated uh, so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, here's a picture of uh, two Khoisan women as well, okay? All right, so we go throughout history and look at um, different archaeological discoveries that have come out recently, like this one here on the Greek island of Crete. In 2010, they found stone tools that date back 130,000 years ago. But Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. And they're saying that this is uh, strong evidence of sailing in the Mediterranean uh, 130,000 years ago. And so these 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 were African. These had to be African people. And, and this shows us sailing at least 130,000 years ago. We look at the lost city of Egypt. There's, there are two lost cities of Egypt. Tanis Heraklion that was built around 8th century BC that is, was swallowed into the sea, Tanis Heraklion, but then also Dazzling Aten, which was discovered uh, in 2021. Okay, Dazzling Aten as well was another lost city. Okay, um, we'll look at uh, th this one. This was a good discovery here out of Morocco where they found remains of Homo sapiens uh, that date back uh, 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. And this is uh, uh, this is over 100,000 years earlier than the previous, than the remains that they had that came out of Ethiopia that they said were the oldest remains of modern man that they dated back 195,000 years ago. These here in Morocco date back between 300,000 to 350,000 years ago, okay? And it shows we were migrating out of East Africa, uh, the Nile Valley region of East Africa, much earlier than a lot of the archaeologists, et cetera, had previously thought. OK, so we go through and we look at different civilizations. We go through and, and, and look at this history. Uh, we look at uh, the African influence here in the U.S. We see the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken. Um, the Greeks call it an obelisk, and we see uh, Tekkens in New York City, London, England. Uh, we see them in Paris, France. These are these are Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural. That were taken from Africa. Ancient Egyptians called obelisks Tekkenu, and they were also used to tell time in the past. Um, their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say the obelisks represented immortality and eternity, and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Currently, Cleopatra's needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks, one in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. The obelisks in New York and London are carved out of red granite, from the quarries of Aswan, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks were commissioned by Nesubiti of Pharaoh Thutmose III for the Temple of the Sun in Heliopolis, near modern day Cairo, with each weighing about 224 tons and 68 feet tall. Check out this article from facetofaceafrica.com called Cleopatra's Needle how three ancient Egyptian uh, obelisks 
ended up in New York City, London, England, and Paris, France, okay? And then we deal with, of course, Asar Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. We know there were at least 1,200 Tekkenu built in ancient times in ancient Kemet, but there are only about a dozen or less than a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, uh, New York City, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar. Uh, this is from page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So we, we also deal with Freemasonry and the African influence on Freemasonry as well and where those teachings come from. Uh, they come straight out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. We deal with the Black Madonna and Child. Uh, also, uh, we look at some of the different uh, Netaru, uh, the different deities in ancient Kemet. We look at things like center class and Joie de Piet. In Joie de Piet, Black Piet was a Moor. So this deals with the history of the Moors in the Netherlands, in Holland, but also in Spain uh, as well. Okay. So th this is just a uh, brief overview of this 10-week online class. There's over 50 articles that we reference in the class. Um, it's about 100 or so slides, something like that, uh, with the slides. We also deal with the film Black Panther, okay? We talk about that in, in, the, uh, in the class because there's a lot of African influences that we see in the film Black Panther, and uh, the Panther deity Bast comes from the uh, Netter, uh, the deity Bastet, the goddess Bastet out of ancient Kemet. And Bastet was an ancient Egyptian goddess worshiped in the form of a lioness and later a cat. She was a goddess of warfare um, in uh, lower uh, Egypt, lower Kemet. She was worshiped as early as the second dynasty, 2890 BCE. So we, we, we deal with that in uh, uh, Black Panther. Um, then we go through and we look at uh, some of the history of the Moors as well. And uh, who, who were the Moors and the Moors going into the uh, Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD. Uh, and they go in 710, led by Tarif, the general Tarif, for the reconnaissance mission, but then going in 711 AD, led by Tariq ibn Ziyad. And we know where they landed in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, they named the mountain Tariq's Mountain, Tariq's Mountain, uh, Jebel Tariq, Tariq's Mountain, which we call Gibraltar. The, so when you hear about the Rock of Gibraltar, that is a mountain named after an African man, Tariq ibn Ziyad. OK, and then we uh, look at what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We look at the Moors losing control of uh, Spain and that last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. Um, we look at uh, Christopher Columbus and how Columbus is, is crucial to understanding the spread of the transatlantic slave trade. And Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba which is 90 miles away, but we're going to see uh, Columbus is, is uh, responsible for the uh, decimation of 12 million to 25 million people. Uh, right Reverend Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, who traveled with Columbus on his voyages, some of his voyages, he estimated that Columbus was responsible for the murder of 12 million to 25 million uh, indigenous people. Now, Dr. David M. Hotep in the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, he talks about how 70% of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages uh, were, were uh, African people. Okay, so then we go through and we look at and we see what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay, then we go through and, and analyze the transatlantic slave trade as well. All right, so this is a 10-week uh, online class. Uh, we don't give any tests. We don't uh, give any grades. You don't have to worry about that. But you're going to learn a lot uh, in this class. How, how do you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. How do you like this type of information? Okay, you can use this with your children also. 
I would say the content is P13. It's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing or anything like that. Uh, the class is going to sell $60, regularly $130. We have the uh, information right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. It's also in the description of this broadcast. And uh, we teach classes normally uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, Sunday uh, and Tuesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So Wednesdays is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we do the sessions live. Then all the sessions are archived and recorded. You can watch them on demand anytime. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. Then uh, Tuesdays, uh, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And we start the class in 18, in the year 1800. And we look at history chronologically, look at that 868 year period of time, okay? So uh, we have a bundle pack for both classes also. They're greatly discounted. Uh, so you can register uh, for that here. We have the bundle pack, so just click on uh, register here. You get both classes for $100. And uh, we have a um, promotion coming up for Black Friday. It won't include the courses because the courses are already greatly discounted, but it includes my, my DVD lectures and digital downloads that we have at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So look out for that as well. Okay, if you want to support the African History Network, also dollar sign the AHN show uh, through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. You can click on the links here and it takes you to our um, Q QR code. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, broadcast the uh, our, our Sunday night show, the African History Network show on Sundays that I've been doing uh, for 12 years, six years on 9, 10 a.m. on the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. Okay, so you can support us that way as well. Uh, Saturday, I will be uh, at Pace Academy in, uh, let's see, Pace Academy in Southfield, Michigan. Um, I'll be there for the uh, pop-up shop that uh, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated uh, is doing. Uh, my sisters at Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, I'll be a vendor there. So it's taking place 12 noon to 6 p.m. We're going to put that on our uh homepage of our website the african history network it's taking place uh 12 noon to 6 p.m and i also posted it on my personal page i need to post it on uh the african history network fan page uh let me pull this up here where is this just a second um let me pull this up here This is taking place. Uh, this is for uh, Small Business Saturday, Black Friday, and Small Business Saturday. It is taking place uh, Saturday, November 26th. Okay, this right here. Let's flip over to this here. Black Friday pop-up shop, Saturday, November 26, 12 noon to 6 p.m., Pace Academy, 23777 Southfield Road, 23777 Southfield Road, Southfield, Michigan. Um, it's a free event, 12 noon to 6 p.m. Come on out, support the vendors. Uh, we'll have a vendor booth there also for the African History Network. So I'll have my DVD lectures, digital downloads, and also... We have lectures now available on flash drive as well. So um, we put the lectures uh, on a flash drive and you just load it onto your computer. Uh, so because a lot of people don't have DVD players uh, today. So we have uh, our lectures in DVD and digital download format and um, in uh, on flash drive also. OK. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever and uh, register for the class and we'll see you in class.